All right, uh, let's get started. So, so far this week, we have looked at uh, optical properties of uh, materials. And uh, we have focused so far on naturally occurring materials, okay, dielectrics, metals, and so on. Okay. Now, we want to focus on how we can engineer rather you know we will uh, we will see what are engineered materials okay i'll explain in a moment what that is okay the whole goal is you know uh, uh, you know one of the key goals of nanophotonics is to design the optical response in the way you want it okay and to do that we'll have to first understand what's the landscape let's look at the materials that are available to us okay and to do that i'm plotting the epsilon and mu in axis like this. So x axis is my epsilon and mu is my vertical axis. Okay. So right now I'm not even bothered about the imaginary parts. Okay. We understand that epsilon and mu are uh, complex quantities. By the way, you know, when I, you know, so far in the beginning, I said that mu, I'll always take it to be one in optical frequencies. Okay. The reason for that is, you know, most of these materials never have a magnetic response. So that's why we didn't care. But in nature, you do have some uh, materials with magnetic response. So I have these four quadrants. And if you look at the most of the dielectrics that we have, or even metals also, they all fall on one single line. This is my mu equal to one line. Okay. So you can have materials like glass, silicon, and so on with different epsilons. Okay. You can also have metals which have a negative epsilon on this axis. Okay, so these are the usual quadrants of metals and dielectrics. Okay. In addition, we have some materials like you know alloys, you know copper alloys and things like that. These are magnetic materials, which are like you know, iron, cobalt, and so on. Some of if you have make some alloys of it, you will have some magnetic response. Okay. So these three quadrants capture all the naturally occurring materials. So there are no natural materials available which exhibit a property of negative mu and negative epsilon. Okay. So in a way, you know, we it, it has some very interesting properties. If you are able to find materials with both negative and uh, negative real and imaginary, sorry, negative mu and epsilon, we can find some interesting applications. Okay. And we want to look for that. We want to engineer that. In the, in the nanophotonics community, I think starting with about 2000, year 2000, there has been a lot of emphasis on this. Okay, at least for 10, 15 years, it was very strong research going on. Okay. And we can get an idea of how to get this negative mu and epsilon by looking at the Lorentz oscillator. Okay. So far, we looked at Lorentz oscillator only for the epsilon. But it is possible that you can create a Lorentz oscillator for even magnetic permeability okay for mu as well i can create and the same things hold okay it's just that the characteristic uh, resonant frequency might be different the the width of the resonance might be different and so on but you can in principle have this sort of a response okay so i'm just showing you one of such you know wherein the epsilon let's say is varying in this fashion the imaginary part is going to be exhibiting a peak and that could even be a peak in the imaginary part of permeability so I can express both my, you know, uh, epsilon and mu as complex numbers in this fashion. Okay. Once we do that, we can uh, we can uh, study some interesting effects. By the way, what does negative epsilon mean? You know, in this case, the epsilon is less than zero, right? Negative epsilon. What does it mean? Well, we already mentioned once, I think, that negative epsilon essentially means that the polarization is going to be opposite to the direction, out of phase with the electric field. All right. So, so what? Okay. The reason why we should care is when we studied Maxwell's equations, I conveniently told you that uh, n is going to be root of epsilon. Okay. But that was a, uh, a simplification. The full refractive index is going to be square root of epsilon and mu. But in the optical regime, optical regime mu equal to 1 typically unless you actually go to some uh, you design structures which exhibit a non uh, mu of not equal to 1 in most cases it's going to be 1 with, if you don't do much okay so in that case of course n is going to be turning out to be root of epsilon but that's not a general scenario okay and the reason 
uh, we find it interesting is because when you have materials with this engineered epsilon and mu, we call them as meta materials. Meta meaning beyond. Okay, beyond the existing materials, that's why we call them meta materials. Okay, so now what I can do is I to get a you know idea of what this is. We are going to discuss them at length at some later point, but right now I just want to give you why this is important. Okay how this is important and the goal is to essentially create what is known as negative index okay how do we do that well if i give you numbers in this form it's not a very easy convenient thing to do a convenient thing to study so what i'll do is i'll write out my uh, the real uh, the epsilon and mu in terms of phasors okay so i have my complex number i can write it in a complex plane as you know we have real and imaginary parts so i can ex i can write it in terms of a amplitude and a phase term okay so for example, if similarly I can do the same thing for the mu. I can write it in terms of a magnitude and phase. So now what I'll do is, I'll say that uh, so far, you know, we have assumed, okay, that mu is always one. There is no uh, phase part, right? There is no uh, angle into that. So from what we know, mu should always be here. Mu equal to one, right? This is what it is. But for a moment, let's say that, okay, there is some, you know, real and imaginary parts and mu is like this. The magnitude of this is this green line and e power i phi, some magnitude term and phase term. Okay. Similarly, I can think of an epsilon, which is in this case, you know, the both mu and epsilon are pl plotted on the same axis just to give you, you know, convenient representation. That's it. Okay. So now the epsilon, I can still plot it as, let's say, I can think of an epsilon of this form minus, let's say, minus 2 plus 0.3 i something like that if i do that how will i represent it of course minus 2 so it should be on the negative side and there is some imaginary term okay so let's say this is my epsilon e power i theta okay so i'm representing i mean of course the magnitudes can be different but i'm normalizing them to each okay the magnitude i'm always making it one so that i can put it on a unit circle okay so now if i have such a scenario what is my refractive index? So now I know my refractive index is simply root of epsilon and mu, right? So I'll end up with a refractive index, which is some magnitude, which is dependent on the magnitudes of epsilon and mu. And I'll have a phase term, which is essentially the average of both the phase of mu and epsilon. So it will be somewhere halfway between that. So if this was my mu and this was my epsilon, my refractive index is going to be in the blue here. So this is my refractive index. Magnitude of n, e times i theta plus phi by 2. Okay, this is my refractive index. So we will, instead of, I mean, I can make some statements about this, but instead of um, uh, making those statements, I'm trying to motivate. You know, how, you know, we said that there is nothing like a negative index that is available naturally. And how we can realize that negative index is what I'm trying to get to. Okay, and by the way, this epsilon and this phasor, right? It's going to depend on frequency, because this is never going to be, you know, a fixed amount. It's going to vary as a function of frequency. So at each point, you're going to get a complex number. All right, that is the dispersion that we talked about multiple times. All right. So what? Okay. The reason is let's consider a few examples. Okay, let's consider a regular dielectric. Okay, in a regular dielectric, I know my mu is equal to one. Let's say my epsilon is some comp number, okay? Let's say that some uh, just, you know, 3 plus 0.2i or something, you know, real and imaginary parts. It doesn't really matter, okay? So if I have a situation, how do I represent this in this complex plane? I'll say my mu is 1, so I'll put it here. And my epsilon also is, you know, the real part is positive, so I'll have to put it somewhere like this. Okay, so my refractive index is going to be the average of these two and that is going to be this. N, right, and something, some phase term, i power something, theta plus phi by two, right? So this is what it's going to be, refractive index. It's That means refractive index is positive, okay? This is positive index. And absorption is not equal to zero. I mean, there's some absorption also because the imaginary term. Now, in this case, I'm putting this as epsilon, mu, and all of them I'm representing on this. The real parts are here, 
uh, I should not do that. I should do this real, and the imaginary parts are on the y-axis, n, mu, epsilon, all of them. Okay, this is what it's going to be. Now, let's think of a lossless metal. Okay, so let's think of uh, same no magnetic response, mu equal to one. Okay, but now a lossless metal, by which I mean that. Okay, I should put it in. I think red. Mu I have used right here. So this is my mu, and my epsilon. I want it to be lossless, so epsilon is going to be some minus epsilon one. There is no imaginary term. Okay, so if there is no imaginary term on the y-axis, it's going to be zero. So this should be the epsilon. When I have an epsilon like this, a mu like this, what will be my refractive index? I can have a zero refractive index. This is my n, right? What does it mean that you have a zero refractive index? Okay, think about the implications of it. What will be the velocity of the wave there, and so on? Okay. So basically, here, n one equal to zero, n two is not going to be zero. Some absorption is there in the material, of course. Okay. By the way, this zero refractive index cannot occur at all wavelengths, but it can occur only when you meet this condition of A lossless metal, which we know is not possible practically, okay, but just as an idea, right? Okay. So now, if you want to make sure that the refractive index goes in this direction, because that's where you can get a negative index, right? If you want to make sure that it can happen like this, we'll have to consider a material with a magnetic response. If you don't, you cannot get negative index, okay? And so, for a while, in the metamaterial community, this was a big rage. Now people are trying to come up with geometries that have a magnetic response. All right. It had all sorts of other experience, other uh, interesting applications as well. So now let's consider a material with some magnetic response. Okay. So now my mu is going to be of this form. Now it's not just one. This is my mu e par i phi. Okay. So it has. Mu not equal to one. Mu is not definitely the standard one. Rather, you know, when I say mu equal to one, I'm meaning mu relative. Okay, not mu zero. Mu zero, of course, it is what it is, right? This mu is essentially mu relative, and epsilon relative. Okay, by the way, it should be that. Okay, so now I can talk of let's say some epsilon. Let's say my epsilon is in this form. Okay, you have a material which is a metal, metal with Small loss. I have this scenario. If I have this scenario, what will be my refractive index? Excuse me. Now again, you just have to look at the angles, and then you have to come up with a average. So it will be something like this, roughly. So my index now n right. N one is negative. And of course, there's non-zero absorption. Okay. So, if you want to have a material with negative index, okay, since we were talking about optical properties of materials, I thought I'll also introduce this fun idea of let's say negative index. I need to create a material with negative response and also preferably very very good metal with low loss. The challenge is. If you have a stronger magnetic response, then you'll able to have index with a good, uh, you know, negative index material with non with low absorption. That's a practically a very challenging thing to do, especially at optical wavelengths. People have done it at uh, uh, RF and microwave, and they 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 see a lot of interesting effects. Okay. In the later in the course, we will talk about how to engineer. the optical response so far it's just an oscillator right we we gave an example of a lorentz oscillator where you have it in nature and you're just understanding it but it turns out that you can actually make this happen even if it is naturally not there you can engineer an electric response or a magnetic response okay how do we do that we will talk about it you know a couple of weeks from now okay but i just want you to want to leave you with this idea that optical response 
it is fundamental to understanding a lot of uh, nanophotonics and you have the naturally occurring responses which we understand using various models and we also have uh, meta materials which are having engineered response okay and uh, if you run any simulations in nanophotonics you will end up using this uh, values of epsilon and mu and so on okay and you need to be careful about what you are using okay if you don't choose the right parameters in your simulation the results that you get are actually not reliable okay so i hope that you know this week's uh, lectures gave you an idea of what a material should look like okay you got some insight into how they should behave so hopefully tomorrow let's say if you pick up some data you understand that and you know what are the limitations of your simulation okay let's say if you are trying to capture a phonon okay and let's say you have an effect because of phonon absorption if you don't put the phonon absorption into your optical materials you can never capture that you know because all the simulators effectively solve the maxwell's equations in various geometries so if you do not supply the right maxwell's equations rather maxwell's equations are always right but uh, you do not supply the right material properties in terms of epsilon real and imaginary parts and mu real and imaginary parts the simulation is not correct isn't it so we have to this is a very critical element of nanophotonics many times you know starting psc students tend to neglect it but if you do uh, it's it's not right i mean you see some research papers which are neglecting some of this okay we should not do that all right so with that message i'll take uh, leave so in the next week we will actually talk about plasmonics which is an interesting uh, approach to nanophotonics all right we will deal with metals so far in this lecture we have talked about metals right we showed that how silver is a very low loss material gold is a low, uh, comparatively low loss material so we see that we can exploit some of these uh, negative epsilon properties of these materials and engineer some interesting effects okay we will talk about that in the subsequent lectures in the next week right thank you so much we'll meet you next week bye